morning, everybody. I'm Michael Kirby, and as has been said, uh, I was present uh, in Bangalore amidst the Bougainvillea and not far from the statue of Queen Victoria uh, in 1988, February 88, when the Bangalore principles were adopted. So we are meeting um, 30 years after that time. I pay respects to Lady Arden and congratulate her on her appointment to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom uh, and thank her for her faithful support over many, many years uh, of uh, the um, uh, use of uh, jurisprudence from Commonwealth countries. Uh, it shouldn't be in only one direction, it should be uh, a shared treasure house of jurisprudence uh, even after the um, Privy Council uh, ceased to have uh, effect in law in most of the countries of the Commonwealth. Uh, I also thank the Bingham Centre and Murray Hunt and uh, Lucy Moxham uh, for organising uh, this conference, uh, picking up the idea. I'm sure that Tom Bingham would be very pleased that we're meeting to talk about this issue. He made a very famous speech uh, which was titled, There is a World Out There, reminding sometimes um, narrow thinking lawyers that there's a great world of jurisprudence uh, out there which can occasionally give assistance uh, to the judges of national jurisdiction. Um, he was himself a great advocate of the use of jurisprudence, including uh, of international law, um, and he warned advocates that they shouldn't turn up to the House of Lords without the case books from uh, other countries of the Commonwealth of Nations, uh, because the uh, House of Lords uh, would not wish to determine cases in the modern age without having access to uh, analogous reasoning in uh, other countries with a similar legal system. Uh, and I thank the IBA and Philip Daminges and uh, Zara Iqbal and the uh, Human Rights Institute of the IBA for cooperating with the Bingham Centre in organising this session today. Uh, it is, as I hope you will conclude, a very timely session. Now, if I go back in my mind to the Bougainvillea and the statue of Queen Victoria and the large hotel there where we gathered and where we were photographed in a famous uh, photograph of the uh, judges who were present, um, all of the participants except uh, one, uh, Mr. Anthony Lester, now Lord Lester of Hern Hill QC, were judges. Um, all of the participants who were judges, except three, uh, were judges of final national courts. Those three were Justice Ehrs, who was a judge of the Karnataka High Court, who was assisting Chief Justice, former Chief Justice Bagwati, uh, the former Chief Justice of India, who was the chairman of the Bangalore meeting, a very distinguished and brilliant uh, man. Uh, and uh, the other two judges who were not judges of final courts were myself, I was then the President of the Court of Appeal of New South Wales, uh, and I was not uh, elevated until 1996, and the other was uh, a, a young uh, judge from the DC Circuit of the United States Court of Appeals, uh, by name Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, Justice Ginsburg, now Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States of America and a megastar by any uh, measure, uh, the subject of films, of uh, musicals, of songs uh, and of celebration uh, was there and uh, neither uh, she nor I knew what lay ahead, but um, I t wrote to her recently and told her of our meeting uh, 
Uh, I was hoping that we might be able to persuade her to come to join us, but unfortunately uh, she had court sitting obligations and uh, as you know, uh, this is quite a, a busy and uh, time of transition in the United States. The key mover for the Bangalore meeting was uh, Mr. Anthony Lester QC. And I know that he has travails of his own at the moment, but no one can take away the wonderful work that Anthony Lester did through Interrights, which was a human rights organization, in gathering the judges to address a very uh, sharp uh, question. Uh, and they were looking at it from the point of view of judges, and they were looking at the question of to what extent and in what circumstances could the judges uh, use international human rights law in resolving ambiguities in the common law, uh, in informing the interpretation of statute law, and in construing the um, uh, constitutional um, remit in uh, their country. And so that was the question on which we were addressing our minds. The judges were from India, Zimbabwe, the United States, Pakistan, uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, uh, Mar Mauritius, um, the United Kingdom, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and as I've said, Karnataka State in India. So uh, that was who was there, and uh, we were looking at what uh, principles could be established as uh, a way of pushing forward knowledge of an undoubted um, contextual factor that uh, existed in our world, namely the very rapid growth of international law of human rights after 1945. It was signalled by the preamble in the Charter of the United Nations that one of the three pillars of the new international organization would be universal human rights. Uh, that was reinforced by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the 10th of December uh, of uh, 1948, the 70th anniversary of which we will all be celebrating in a few weeks' time. Uh, and uh, it was reinforced by the treaty law of the United Nations, in particular the International Bill of Rights and the two great covenants which had been adopted as treaty law. And the question was, how do we make this something that is not simply symbolic, that executive governments sign on to and then forget about and hope it will go away, but how do we uh, infuse the ideas of the uh, international human rights treaty law into a local decision making. And so these were the two key paragraphs of the Bangalore principles. Seven, it is within the proper nature of the judicial process and well established judicial functions for national courts to have regard to international uh, obligations which a country undertakes, whether or not they have been incorporated into domestic law for the purpose of removing ambiguity or uncertainty from national constitutions, legislation or common law. Eight, however, where national law is clear and inconsistent with international obligations of the state concerned, in common law countries the national court is obliged to give effect to national law. In such cases, the court should draw such inconsistency to the attention of the authorities, uh, since the supremacy of national law in no way mitigates a breach of international obligations which have been undertaken by the country. So there was there a nod to the old law, but there was also a nod to a new way forward to uh, utilize uh, international human rights law in clarifying uh, ambiguities in the domestic law. When I went back to Australia, having been brought up in the tradition of strict, strict uh, dualism, uh, I naturally approached my duties as the President of the Court of Appeal with uh, great care. But I began to see in cases instances where uh, the common law was 
often simply silent. There was no statute that dealt with the problem, and the constitution in Australia is particularly silent in these matters. And that being the case, I began to reach for the principles and jurisprudence that had been developed around international human rights law. And one of the cases where that was involved was a case concerning an interpreter, the right to an interpreter, and in this case particularly the right to an interpreter in the mute language, uh, deaf and dumb we used to call it, and uh, a judge had told an interpreter that she needn't uh, interpret for the, uh, the litigant because the matter was simply a matter of legal argument, so that you don't have to interpret. And when he noticed that the interpreter was still interpreting, he said, Madam, I've told you, don't interpret, please. This is a, just a legal argument. And when he later saw that he, she was still interpreting, he said, Madam, I have told you, you should not interpret. This is purely legal argument and you have to obey my rules of procedure in this court. And she said to her eternal credit, whilst I am in an open court and whilst the litigant in this court cannot understand what is happening, it is both my moral and professional responsibility to interpret. Uh, we went outside in the Court of Appeal when they came to us and we looked uh, at the law on the matter and we found a decision of the High Court of Australia in a case called Aquilina against dairy farmers uh, and that gave the rather unedifying uh, instruction to judges throughout the country uh, the determination of whether an interpreter should be provided is in the discretion of the trial judge but it didn't say what principles should inform the discretion and so the three judges of the Court of Appeal of New South Wales decided that it was relevant to have regard to what the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights said about the right to interpreters. Australia had signed it, and though it was not incorporated, judges had their own responsibility to develop the common law and could do so by reference to such an important universal principle. Uh, and. Uh, more and more cases came where that technique was proving quite useful and increasingly my colleagues were agreeing with me uh, because we give many of the decisions extempore and therefore that has to be dealt with immediately and on the spot. And then in uh, 1992 a very important case came before the High Court of Australia called Marbo against Queensland number two. This was the case that reversed 150 years of land law in Australia and held that uh, the rights of the indigenous people, the Aboriginal people in Australia, to their native title should be recognised in the common law. And this is what Justice Brennan said, and when I read it, I thought, uh, this is Bangalore. Whatever justification advanced in earlier days for refusing to recognise rights and interest in land of, in, of the indigenous inhabitants of settled colonies, uh, this unjust and discriminatory doc uh, doctrine can no longer be accepted. The expectations of the international community accord in this respect with the contemporary values of the Australian people. The opening up of the international uh, remedies to uh, individuals pursuant to Australia's accession to the optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil Legal Rights brings to bear on uh, the uh, common law the powerful influence of the covenant and the international standards it imports. And here's the crucial phrase. The common law does not necessarily conform with international law, but international law is a legitimate and important influence on the development of the common law, especially where international law declares the existence of universal human rights. And it was that key that allowed the High Court of Australia to unlock the door of 150 years of land law and provide for uh, the um, uh, principle uh, that it adopted. Encouraged by that principle, when I was appointed to the High Court of Australia, I uh, went ahead uh, to try to persuade other judges. I had less success in the High Court of Australia than I had had in the 
Court of Appeal of New South Wales, law is very hierarchical. But um, eventually, um, my um, efforts to have the principles of the Bangalore Statement incorporated as part of the Australian constitutional approach to uh, interpreting constitutional texts um, inflamed my colleagues so that Justice McHugh, in a case called Al Kateb against Godwin, said this is heresy, and Justice uh, Hayden in a case uh, called Roach against the Electoral Commissioner, said no uh, judge uh, in uh, the High Court of Australia except one has adhered to this view. And there was a footnote to a whole series of my opinions uh, and a reference to early decisions in the 20th century to the contrary effect. So um, the net result is that the uh, Bangalore principles, at least in a country like Australia that doesn't have a Bill of Rights in its constitution, uh, doesn't have a, a, a footing that is very helpful in most countries of the world where there are a Bill of Rights, uh, there's a Bill of Rights with its provisions and they can give a footing to the jurisprudence that has developed around equivalent uh, provisions in, in the international community. And so uh, the question that confronts us at this uh, meeting, 30 years on from the Bangalore principles, is were those principles ahead of their time? Were they relevant to a time of optimism, globalism, internationalism, uh, communitarianism, uh, and the sharing of ideas of our common humanity? Uh, and of recognising the role of judges uh, to share those ideas and reflect them uh, and be part of the procedure for incorporating them where that was appropriate? Or has the period in between, and in particular the very recent period which we've faced uh, in our world, uh, turned in a contrary direction? Does, for example, <coughs> the development uh, of uh, Mr. Trump's view of national sovereignty making America great again uh, and turning backwards to uh, the individual nation state, uh, is that a step away from these uh, basic notions that in our humanity we share enough commonality <coughs> of principle uh, and respect each other's humanity and therefore will give reflection uh, of that respect in our uh, decisions in the courts. And I think this is the contemporary relevance with Brexit uh, for the issues which we are going to be dealing with today. Um, has the t tide turned in an antagonistic way or is this simply a temporary interruption to the onward flow that accompanies the technology and the realities of the world of today and what is the status of the Bangalore principles and the role of the judge, uh, apart from Parliament, to incorporate in an appropriate way uh, decisions of international human rights law. So I pay respects to Justice Bagwati I pay respects to Anthony Lester who organised the Bangalore uh, conference <clears throat> and I pay respects to you for coming along because this is undoubtedly one of the key issues at the moment in history which we are living through.